Hi, I'm Gerald Alston of the Manhattans, and you're watching Soul One TV. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm just going to get right to it. We have a true, true legend in the house tonight. From the Manhattans, the one and only Gerald Alston. You got it, Greg. How's it going? Oh, man, everything is cool, man. Just trying to just trying to lay low in this. Uh, I guess this is the hopefully the beginning of the end of this pandemic. Yes. Yes. Everybody's kind of itchy to get back out there. That's right. So I got um, a big itch, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm <a> great <laughs> big itch. I just want to start off with, with, with a few That's questions. New again. Imperials. Yes. That was the group that you was with before you uh got together with the Manhattans. Right. Um, the New Imperials was formed by myself and my cousin, the late Dwight Fields. Who, oh, okay. Who, um just he passed away in 2016. And he stepped in when Blue passed. We're first cousins, father and mother, sisters and brothers. And um, uh, his father is was one of the five founding members of the Five Blind Boys of Alabama. Okay. I started singing together when we were kids. And um, Friday and Saturday, we were the New Imperials. And okay. on Sunday, we were the Gospel Jubilee. Okay. How many times did, did the brothers with the Manhattans try to pursue you? I'm glad you asked it that way because so many times they say, well, the first interview, they check my bio or history. They say, well, the first couple of times, first time they ask you, you refused. I never refused. Oh, okay. The Manhattans were on tour. They were on tour with the Supremes. Gene Terrell was singing lead okay. Supremes at that time. And um, so they did some, they did some HBCUs as they were driving down to Dallas. So they stopped at my college. My professor, after class, asked me, do you mind if the Manhattans use your sound system? They are performing here tonight. Mm, I said, oh. So I went home. I got my system, brought it back, and set it up. I was testing it out. And then walked the late Blue Lovett, late Kenneth Kelly, late Richard Taylor, our former manager, Hermie Hamlin, and Philip Flood. And Philip was standing in for the lead singer because Smitty yeah. was real. So anyway, they watched me do the rehearsal, go through the song, and then they asked me if I wanted to sing on the show. I said, yeah. So I rehearsed with the band and got my little song together. They took my name and address, and after the show, um, they went to A&T to perform. Smitty got sick, and they had to fly him home. And they called me that Sunday. And that Monday morning, I dropped my books off at college, and I headed to Dallas, Texas. <laughs> so, um, so what did the other guys in, in, in the Imperials say? By that time, we were, we had, I started college, my, my, yeah. plus my cousin had started, and he was going yeah. to a different college, and we were like working off and on. What I really admired about him, he said, cuz, he said, you don't get but one chance like this in a lifetime. He said, take it. He said, we'll be fine. You take that opportunity. And he continued the group working. Uh, they worked as the New Imperials. And then he formed his own group called Authentics out of Washington, D.C. And that was your cousin? Yes. If it wasn't your cousin, it might have ended a little differently. It might have been some yeah. fisticuffs going on. <laughs> <laughs> the furniture yeah. might be shuffling around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You moved on with the Manhattans. Right. And uh, what was that? 1970. Correct. Was when you joined up with them. And the first record that y'all did was. Our very first single was a tune uh, um, called I Can't Stand for You to Leave Me. And that was on King Records. Then we came back with A Million to One. 
One Life to Live. And um, okay. those were the songs that were released, released from that album. We left King Records in 1971. And okay. we started Columbia in December of 72. We're going to start right there with There's No Me. There's no house without a home. And there's no man who wants to be alone. There's no child without a dream. And there's no song without a music. Everybody know what I'm saying. No me without you. Now that was the first gold record. Okay, when that first hit, how did you feel? What was going through your mind? That was a not just only a beautiful song. That was one of the most meaningful songs to me, and um, words can't begin to express how that song made me feel from day one. We rehearsed. I never forget. We rehearsed that song in our office for. Like a few weeks, we rehearsed all the, like the first five songs on that album. We rehearsed in our office every day for about two or three weeks before we went into session. When we did that session, I sung that song one time. In fact, we all did it one time. Put the background, I did a scratch. They put the background vocals on. I went back in and I sang it the first time straight through. That was it. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I got to tell you a quick story of um, out there at uh, Yoshi's because you guys perform quite often at Yoshi's. Yes. And uh, my guys do too. So you're watching Soul One After Dark. We'll be right back. There's no me without you. Depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, they have more power over us than they should, but they don't have to. Be the change, start the conversation today. Speak on it and silence the shame. I like that little side move with the mic there. Who, who made that up? Pop Charlie Atkins. He was a, a choreographer for The Temptations, Gladys Knight, oh, yeah. The OJs, The Jackson Five, The Supremes. He was awesome. Pop was awesome. Yeah. There's more words I could find to express it. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me just tell you a quick story. When you say, uh, you know, how the people appreciate the music and everything and yeah. appreciate you in general. Um, there was a time that we was at Yoshi's, um, and apparently you guys was coming the next week or the week after or something, right? Mm -hmm. Now, after we finished our, our final set, we out there, you know, we got a little merchandise and everything going right outside the door. Right. So we doing our little merchandise. Here, one woman come up. We talking. Then she talking up. Oh, woo! I got to see Joe. I got to got to. Get my tickets for Joe. So I said to myself, okay, yeah, well, you know, just buy this merchandise and you go yeah. on there and get your tickets. For Joe. Yeah. Then here comes another one. Wow. Oh, Lord, Joe coming. Child, did you get your tickets for Joe? I'm like, you know what? <laughs> just buy some of my merchandise and go on over there and get your tickets for Joe. I don't want to hear about Joe no more, you know. <laughs> Listen, I, I started playing right. I said, oh, girl, Joe coming. Yes, Joe. But you know what? Right now, you sitting here with us right here. Buy some of this merchandise and go on and get your damn tickets. You know, listen, <laughs> they love you, man. They love yeah. you. Yeah. And half of them can't even pronounce your name the right way. Gerald, 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 Gerald. Yeah. But what, how does that feel to know that people are waiting for you? They just waiting. You know, that's 
um, it's such a wonderful feeling to know that that we through our songs and performances that we pay, pay um, we give so much to our fans and that we play an important role in their lives. There are no words to describe it. You have to just feel it. Let me move on to 1976. Let's just kiss and say goodbye, right? Right. Okay. Let's just kiss and say goodbye. Just kiss and say goodbye. That's to this day the biggest selling song, right? Yes. How did that song come about? The late Blue Lovin' wrote Kiss and Say Goodbye. We had a three-piece band, and when we were off, they would stay, they were from Philly, but they would stay up here if we had if we had like a week in between shows sometimes. Okay. And we would rehearse every day that they were here. Blue called me and said, Gerald, I need you to be at rehearsal at least an hour or so <clears throat> before everybody get there. I said, okay. He said, I want to play the song for you. And I'll never forget it. He sat at the keyboard and he started playing. He said, sing this. It's going to hurt me. I can't lie. Maybe you meet another guy. Understand me. Won't you try? Let's just kiss and say Goodbye. And the rest was history. It was, Blue actually wrote the song for a country and western artist. Yeah. And wow. we weren't that crazy about it because country and western. We sing <laughs> R&B. Nothing against country and western because they have some great singers and great songs. Yeah. But that just the, that type of singing just wasn't who we were, we thought. Yeah. And so we went in and recorded it. It said in the can, 18 months. Wow. The vo my vocal is a scratch vocal. The background okay. vocals were scratched, so they weren't, nothing was complete, really. And all of a sudden, we got a call. We were in some part of the South. And my manager called, said, well, Columbia just released Kiss and Say Goodbye. And Blue said, oh, my <laughs> God, they trying to destroy us. <laughs> <laughs> they released that song. And by June of 76, it had already uh, went gold on its way to platinum. Mm. And it just goes to show you what's missing today. Um, you know, music today have perfect tracks, perfect vocals. You know, everything is perfect. But you miss the feel of the musicians, the guys standing yeah. next to you singing. You know, you miss all of that. Must have been a good feeling. Oh, yes. We're going to be right back with Gerald Austin on Soul One After Dark. And I had to meet you here today. Oh, baby. There's just so many things to say. Who are you sharing your secondhand smoke with?
that version I, was produced by Magic that plays keyboards with the Whispers. I was oh. looking around for stuff, and I heard that one. I was like, "Wow, that's that, yeah. that's kind of different. That, yeah. That's kind of different there. A little electronic stuff happening there." Yeah. A long time ago, I call it my almost meeting you. Uh huh. We was at Constitution Hall. I was singing with Will Hart at the time. Uh -huh. It was me, Will, and that day we had Dr. Salam. And I'm sure you know who Dr. I'm yeah. sure you know who Dr. Salam is. I was saying to myself, I got to get back there and take a picture with Gerald. I was on my way back there to your dressing room. And you came out the dressing room. And the look on your face, I was like, oh, hell no. Something, 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 man. He, he got this look on his face like, if I say one word, he's going to slap me or something. So I said, you know what? You know what? Uh, maybe another time I'll catch up with this brother because it seemed like something was on your mind at the time. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably just chewed somebody out about their performance or maybe had a meeting with the guys in the band, you know, because we're all family, man. And that's one thing I can say. Um, we may get angry at each other, may go through something, but at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. And yeah. that's to be successful at performing, recording, and, you know, getting it right. Our fans deserve nothing less. So that's probably what you sure. ran into. Or, <laughs> or, or the promoter didn't have all my money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay, there we go. <laughs> it was it was Manhattan's, Delphonics, and I believe it was Jerry Butler on that show. This was years oh, ago. Yes, I know who exactly that was. He was running around with the money. I, I knew exactly who it was. I knew exactly <laughs> what it was about. The man did not have all our money. He pays oh, us. Oh, okay. But he was moving around, you know. That's exactly what it was. Moving ahead to 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we got Shining Star. Right. Shining Star did well. Shining Star yep. did well. The Grammy came with that one. That's it. Now, listen. Was those hammer pants I saw on y'all right there? <laughs> Almost. You know. At the um, Universal Amphitheater, which is now, I think it's called a Gibson uh, mm -hmm. in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, and, and again, again, you guys, the, the steps was always, you, you guys' steps was just different. The reason that happened, that happened I loved it when pop would choreograph our songs. Because yeah. a lot of times, everything, like most artists do their stuff on the drum beat or something yeah. like that. Pop would hear a guitar lick and have you do a quick step on a guitar lick or uh, he what the piano was playing and he wants you to step with the piano. It'll still be in time with everybody else, but it'll just be a mm. step, a different feel. And, and yeah. that's what Pop did. Oh God, Pop. Charlie Atkins was the best. <laughs> was the best you know everybody every musician every singer we all have this what i call a hell no moment <laughs> where where somebody do something and basically you saying oh hell no i will not give me two of your hell no moments oh god <laughs> <laughs> or maybe three if, if you need more time you know um one hell no moment we were playing in a place in Chattanooga. This was just before Kiss and Say Goodbye. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was definitely the Chitlin Circuit. This was all the way Chitlin. 
the club seated about 500 people, but and it had a high stage. And behind the stage was our dressing room. Then there was a, um, it was like a cinder block wall. But in the wall, there was a great big hole. And you could look right in our dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> and see us perform. And um, that was a problem with the money, with the sound. That's what it was. And I'm looking at this hole in the wall. And <laughs> we had a promotion person that was working with us by the name of Bob Rowley, one of the greatest okay. promotion men that ever lived. He knew his job and he did it yeah. well. I told Bob, I said, oh, hell no. Uh -uh. I'm not going to I'm through with this. I am through with this. We did the first show. That's what happened. We did the first show. Yeah. Came back, I said, oh, hell no. I'm quitting right now. I was, I was building. And Bob uh, came out and talked to me a long time and told me, said, cuz, we almost got it. Just stick to it. <laughs> I was ready to go home that night. And he talked me into doing the second show. And the place was jam-packed. It was that hole in the wall. The sound was messed up. And the guy was talking funny about the money. That was one moment. <laughs> that was a double hell no right there. <laughs> we were in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We was playing this venue that was right on the lake. Beautiful scenery. It was a nice club, but it was small. Yeah. And so we had to dress in the in the room where the coats were, where they hung the coats and stuff. A lot of people don't understand. This is what goes on with these. Yes. You know, everybody think it's just fabulous and just everything. Listen, it, it's a mess out there. Yeah. And a fight broke out. <laughs> these guys were going and you could hear tables crashing and 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 the guy, they said, he's running over here. And so the guy ran into our dressing room. And when he ran in the dressing room and closed the door, he turned his back to me. And it looked like somebody had took a shredder and ripped his coat down the back. This is where the guy was swinging at him with a knife or something and was hitting his coat. His coat was cut about three or four places and looked like it was shredded. <laughs> I said, again, I was with Bob Rowley. <laughs> I said, Bob, we got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> It'll be all right. I'll handle it. And um, he went outside, got him in control, and we finished the show. But that was a hell moment, a moment, hell moment. <laughs> I was ready to get out of Dodge because I didn't know what was going to happen. That's that Chitlin circuit. We played yeah. Chit Chitlin circuit from 1970 to 73. We kind of started playing with the There's No Me Without You. Things picked up. And then after it died down, we came back out with Kiss and Say Goodbye. Don't Take Your Love mm -hmm. from 74. And then we came back with Kiss and Say Goodbye, 76. Mm, that's, that's a little piece of the history. We definitely got more to go because uh, you got a lot of mileage on you, my brother. You yeah. got a whole lot of mileage. <laughs> yes, tell me about it. We'll be right back with Soul One After Dark with Gerald Austin. Make the decision to be there for the veterans in your life. Learn more at BeThereForVeterans.com Give my love to your home Two guys that's in the group now. What yeah. what are their names? Uh David Tyson and Troy May. Okay, um, and they've and they've been with you quite a few years now, huh? Seven years. David is the brother of Ron Tyson. Yeah, team. okay. Yeah. Mm, okay. Out of that Tyson clan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The next song I'm gonna uh check out here. Mm. This song here is one of my favorites. Crazy. Oh, yeah.
crazy, 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 crazy. It, it seemed to me a, a different kind of feel for y'all. Yeah, it, that was produced by uh, Skip Anderson and Steve Williams. Skip was a keyboard player for Luther for years. We wanted, always wanted to do up-tempo stuff, but it had to be just right. And when Skip yeah. and Steve played this for us, this was it. We knew it. The response is always good to that song. In fact, Pop Charlie Atkins did the choreography on that one. I see. I yes. see. Did anybody ever tell you that you kind of favor B.B. King a little bit? Oh, wow. I've heard nah. Herbie Hancock and I've heard Al Green. If I find Lucille and put it in your hands, they'd swear you was a young B.B. <laughs> King. They'd swear you was a young B.B. King. B.B. was... Um, he was truly a friend. We worked yeah. together. I'd go by his room and speak to him and, and, and things like that. But when I would go out on, like, especially out of the country, I would always yeah. write him and send him mm. postcards. And I remember I had my son on the road with me and he took a picture with yeah. uh, BB, right? He was a little bitty yeah. thing. BB had him up in his arms. And he took the picture with him. So when we played, um, we were some, I forgot where we were. And then maybe the Fox in Detroit or something like that. Yeah. When I came back, we were at the um, Star Plaza in uh, yeah. Indiana. So anyway, I showed yeah. him the picture. And B.B. looked at the picture and said, oh, you giving this to me? And I said, but B.B., I only got one. He said, no, you have to get you another one. He took the picture. <laughs> but I did have another one. And the same thing, Bobby Bland did the same thing. But now, um, at one point, you decided to go um, solo. Right. Now, what, what brought on that decision? You know, it had gotten to be a job. We had worked so much that we didn't get a chance to rehearse like we want to, or like we used to, because we were going out for seven days at a time, or go out sometimes. I remember we went out one time for a week, and we stayed out three weeks. We didn't have time to rest, really, or to rehearse. One day, so, something happened to me. I went and rehearsed, went to our group meeting, and I said, fellas, I didn't have a deal. I had nothing. I said, this is my last year with you guys. I'm out of here. But I'll stay with you until you find somebody to replace me. Okay. I also wanted to have a solo career. So that's when I left the group, and then I got a deal with uh, Taj Records and then Motown. Bought my contract out and became Taj Motown. And um, I did three albums on Motown. And then I did one on Scotty Brothers. It was very gratifying because I had a chance as a solo artist. I played Rio. I played Europe. I did all over Europe, Amsterdam, Japan. You know, and the difference was that all eyes were on me. Mm. I, well, fine lady singing with me, but <laughs> all eyes was on me on stage. And that that was rough because you have you had one chance to get it right. I, I did that for well, six years, and then we did a reunion. You do know that was kind of unfair to them guys because you talking about you going to stay till they find, who the hell are they going to find to replace you? <laughs> <laughs> who the hell was they going to find to replace you? You knew it. You, oh, boy. Uh, we're going to take another break. I'm going to treat you like they did Michael Jackson. We're going to move on to the new stuff. I, I like the old stuff, but uh, the new stuff is where, you know, whatever he said, whatever he said back then, you know. You know, Ooh, you I know. Can see. You're watching Soul One After Dark with Gerald Austin. I've lost more friends to suicide since I've been out than I lost in combat. Call your congressional representatives and demand that they vote yes on the Medicinal Hemp Act. We're American veterans and, and we, we approve, approve this, this message. message. What's happening? It's your boy Marcus Miller. You are watching Soul One TV. That was the young Gerald right there. Yeah, yeah. I saw you. Mm. <laughs> that video was shot at Studio 54. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. You uh, tell me which one you want to go over right now. She's coming home or get ready. Let's do get ready first, because that was the first single. Told the fellas I'm not going out tonight. There's something else I'd rather do. So you can light the candles and you can pour the wine. Cause I'm in a hurry to get home to you. It's been quite a while since we've had this time. So many other things were on our minds. The kids are all gone, now it's just you and I. We don't have to rush, we can take our time. What you know about that, man? Wait a minute. <laughs> Getting Ready was written by producer Curtis Dukes and myself. Okay. We were just sitting around, trying. we were trying to figure out, you know, which way to go with this song. And Curtis already yeah. had the track. So bottom line, getting home, making love to your lady. I enjoyed doing that song. High heels on and, <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> She could just be in flip flops for me. I don't need that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask you a question. After we finish performing, we leave the venue, and most of the time, I head over to one of them twenty-four hour WalMarts because I don't have a Walmart where I live. So I, I love me some WalMart. So I'm always in WalMart. Yeah. So when Gerald Austin get off stage, where can you find Gerald Austin? After being in this business for fifty years. When the show is over, I go back to my hotel. Sometimes I may hang out. I don't drink or yeah. smoke, but I may hang out in the yeah. lounge with some of my guys or friends mm -hmm. over there for a while. And then I go to my room, put on me a movie, and I let the movie watch me. As I got older, I realized I need to get my rest so that I could be able to step on that stage and give my best at all times. Because your fans don't want to hear you say, oh, I'm tired. I'm hoarse. I can't, you know, they don't want to hear none of that. Maybe you should call up some of these other guys and let them know that little secret there. <laughs> Take their butt to bed. That's it. You know? Why is it so hard for these groups to kind of stay together these your, days? In your opinion. A lot of times people get into their heads. Lead singers leave the group. Oh, man, you don't need them. You can do it all by yourself. You blah, 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 blah. This and that, this and that. I heard it. People tell me. Oh, you don't need the Manhattans. Uh, you can do it all by yourself. And that's not true because when the Manhattans is on stage, it takes each and every one of us to make that show happen. I thank God to this day. When I left the group, I didn't leave the group because somebody told me I could do it by myself. I just yeah. wanted to try it. I was, I was offered to leave the group about a year after I got in and was offered some nice. Wow. I won't say who it was, what record <laughs> company it was, but it was in the 70s. But I told him, nope. I knew that the money didn't mean as much as building what we have today. I would have been less than a man to jump up and leave them and just got where I said, oh, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. Yeah, I understand. Now, the passing of Blue, love it. How did that affect you and the group? It was rough because we watched Blue deteriorate over maybe a year and a half. What kept Blue going for so long was he was able to come out on the road. And um, mm. he performed like nothing was wrong with him. Wow. And, um, I spent the last week with Blue before he passed. He passed about mm -hmm. 10 days after we had spent some time together. Mm. And um, I remember going to visit him. I didn't tell him I was coming. I got on the plane, I told my wife, I said, my heart is telling me to go to Phoenix. 
Yeah. I got on. She said, go. I said, Blue don't like surprises. She said, Gerald, go. And I called Blue's wife when I got there. And um, she said, um, well, I, I don't have a room, spare room fixed up. I said, don't worry about it. I'll get a hotel room. But I want to see you guys. I want to see Blue. So she told, she didn't tell Blue. I drove out to the house and Blue was, he wasn't feeling well. He was in the bed. And um, I went in the bedroom and he looked in my face. He said, what you doing here? I said, brother, I came to see you. I came to spend some time with you. And his whole disposition is like he got so much better. And, uh, and, and I told him how much I loved him and that I was there for him. And I stayed there with him. We went out and I took him to get his hair cut. We went out to lunch together. We talked. Mm. You know, we, we didn't even talk about his illness. We talked yeah. about just living and having a good time. And um, it was so, it was, I think out of all the years that we've been together, that was the, one of the best times that I was spent with him. The night that he passed, I spoke to him as well. Even though yeah. I knew what was happening, it was, it was like heartbreaking. The last night that he performed with us at a club, all the guys came on stage because they lived in D.C. All the guys mm. from the early 70s, except one. He was in North Carolina. They came on stage and they sang, they played. And when they started playing, it was like I'd never missed them. They was always, it's like they were always there. And um, But at his memorial, it was so touching. And it wasn't sad. It was uplifting. And, and even to this day, you know, when we go on stage, um, we miss him. He was a big brother. Yeah. He was, he was everything. Mm. Wow. Another one of my favorite videos that y'all, y'all did a nice little routine on this one, and blue, blue was down with this right here. Check this okay. out. Ooh, come on. been dancing all night long come on baby get close to me we never dance to a love song not so disco music it's fine sometimes yes it is yeah love song i love that man and it, uh sitting down with that mic and everything that that, that was hot man sunny and i wrote that in england mm -hmm. uh I, it was like another one of those moments let's get back to today's stuff now hey, what's I, going on what's, what's going on with this she's uh, coming home now, <laughs> talk to me now. What's what's He's going on? Coming home. Well, okay, Greg. You know when you go out, and like in our case, we go out to perform, and you got your lady with you. She looking good. She's dressed fine. Boy, she's just looking glorious. And so naturally, you have to go in the dressing room to get dressed, or you may go step away and go get her a drink or something, and come back. But at any rate. The other guy's been looking like, whoa, man, look at this lady. So the first opportunity they get, they might walk over and ease her a number or start trying to hit. And um, so and it made me feel good to, to know that somebody else could see the beauty that I was seeing. And so the song came about was you can give her your number. You can go over to the table and try to hit on her. But at the end of the night, she's coming home with me. Right on. She's coming home with me. Ooh, yeah. I knew right from the start she was the one for me. Yes, she was. She was so fine and had a strong personality. Oh, yeah. She's like a rose, such a beautiful flower. I wanna be with her every hour. That's why I know that our love was meant to be. Oh yes, 
it was That makes me feel this way Whenever there's a cloudy day From all those guys you see But I'm not worried about it Oh no, she's coming home Oh, yeah. yeah coming man. home. Troy yeah. and Dave, I have to tell you, man, these guys are awesome. If, if, if I had two right hands, they'd be both right hands. They <laughs> stepped up. They stepped in and did the work from back in 1993 to this present day. And it's an honor to have them guys to be on stage and be there with me to help carry the show. If anybody wants to get our material, our new CD, you can go to our website, Let's Just Kiss and saygoodbye.com. You could go to CD Baby. You could go to um, Amazon. You can go to um, iTunes, Spotify. You can get the record, get, download it, and stream it there. Also, you can follow us on Facebook and on Instagram, The Manhattans featuring Gerald Alston. Over the years, you know, people have been in and out, and there have been different separations like that. But one thing I, I, I notice about the I'll say the Manhattan's brand mm -hmm. that I know there's another Manhattan's group and, and everybody seemed to kind of just do what they do and get along. And it's no, you know, no crazy stuff going right. on. Because as you know, there's several Delphonic groups, there's mm -hmm. uh, stylistics, multiple blue magics. Mm -hmm. And it seemed mm -hmm. like these guys, it, it, it's just, it's just a little cat fight all the time. Yeah, It was in the early stages of it. There were, some legal wrangling. But finally we sat down and we got it together. And um, before Blue passed, Sonny had the other group. Yeah. he And that's the reason he didn't come back to do the reunion. He had the other group. And um, so in the in interim of all of that, after everything was settled, we became, we became Sonny had just as much as right to use the name as Blue and I did. And so Sonny, became his group, Sonny Bivens Manhattans. And before then, yeah. they just used the Manhattans. Um, but Blue and I used the Manhattans featuring Gerald Alston and Blue Lovin. After Blue passed, it was just the Manhattans featuring Gerald Alston. And I always make that distinction because um, I want the people to know the difference. And everybody that knows the Manhattans with Gerald Alston knows that I am, it's quote unquote, I don't like saying this, but I am the Manhattans. We don't have a problem. I go out That's with Gerald Austin, the Manhattans featuring Gerald Austin, and they go, the other group go out as the Manhattans of Sonny Bivens. Yeah. So people know what they're getting and who they're getting. That's really cool, you know, and um, you should tell some of these other guys, they, they need to just, you know, sit down and just, and just be realistic about this whole thing. And it's a big world. Exactly. You know, but what makes Gerald Alston happy? Um, my family, that's number one. And my other family, the Manhattans. Yeah. That makes me happy. I go to church, I sing gospel. I still sing my gospel, mm -hmm. praising God and, and singing songs from here mm -hmm. make me so very happy. So, I mean, one more question. Um, did, you, did you take your shot? Um, I can't take my shot until the second or third week of April, but I am going to take it. And I would oh. like to say to everybody, take the shot, you know, or, and wear your mask and be safe. Uh, I hear you know, so many people complaining about, well, this person had a reaction, that person had a reaction. Compare it to the people, the millions of people who had no side effects. Yeah. It doesn't equal up. I just got my first shot myself, you know. I went on in there, you know, I hollered. I hollered. I was in there hollering, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like no needles, you know, yeah. but uh, I had to do it. Me and my man went on up in there and did it. I got to get back out on this road, man. Yeah. You know? We got dates coming up now. So the three of us are in line to get our shots now because I don't want to go back out there not covered. Yeah. I don't want to give it to nobody and I don't want nobody to give it to me. So the best thing for us to do is make sure everybody is covered and go have a good time. Your, your boys here will be wearing masks. <laughs> All 12 of us will be wearing masks. Right. We did a show down in Florida back in 
maybe September, October, it, it was a wedding. Mm -hmm. So everybody was separating. And the funny thing is, we about to run out there and um, I turn around, look at my man, the lead singer. He still had his mask on. I said, man, take your mask off. <laughs> That's it off. And we had to do it. We got to yeah. Do it. Shout out to Cliff Perkins, my man, Cliff. Oh, yeah. You know. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Cliffy. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, it's yeah. been a pleasure having you on here. Um, I love the new music. Anytime you're ready to come back on here, the platform is here. Thank you. Platform is here, brother Austin. And Greg, I'd just like to thank you, man. You have a very, very good professional show. I, I can't find the words. Man, I've done a lot of interviews, but nothing like yours. Nothing. You are top yeah. of the baby. You doing it. I wanted to do something different and something more. I try to give you an experience. That's mm -hmm. that's the best way I can put it, you, you know. You nailed it. You nailed it. You're doing it. I'm trying. I appreciate it. Listen, coming from you, I appreciate it. Keep up the great work. You know. uh, my bell. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just kiss and say goodbye. Thank you all for watching Soul One After Dark. Bye.